Well, good, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm very pleased to be here again this year. Um, and uh, taking on the story that I began last year. And I'd like to say thank you to some faces in here who I recognise when I started this pilgrimage, this odyssey through building in England um, in the year 410. I mean, obviously I wasn't giving the lecture in 410, but, you know, the notion was starting in 410. And we've come through uh, the Middle Ages and we've come to this incredibly interesting phase, um, phase that I call... Um, tonight's lecture, the end of the old world order, this period between um, 1530 and 1630, the period, if you like, between the sort of Reformation and the Civil War, I think one of the most interesting, complicated and fiercely argued about periods, not only in English history, but in English architectural history. And um, as previously in this uh, series of uh, lectures I've been given, I'll give you my own personal view of uh, the development of building in England over this period and look forward um, at the end, perhaps, to hearing some of your uh, comments um, and questions. So in around about 1510, after a really long period of stagnation, the population of England started to grow again. This was, I think, largely due to a reduction in plague mortality, and uh, the population grew from 2 million in about 1500, past 4 million a century later in 1600, and only 30, only 30 years later peaked at 5 million. So this was a 130% increase in population. Um, and this very sudden explosion of people after a long period uh, of depopulation was an absolutely key factor in a century of what turned out to be very rapid and very fundamental change. But there were some other backgrounds to the changes that took place in this century, and these were changes in the way people thought. There was a new interest, of course, in classical learning, the Renaissance. And from 1532, there was the reform of the English church, the Reformation. Now, I don't think Renaissance is a very good term to help us understand what happens in English architecture uh, in this century. Both the terms Renaissance and the terms Middle Ages were actually invented by Italian humanists who were protesting against the narrowness of medieval university education. And these terms disguise both the appreciation and knowledge of ancient civilizations that existed before the 14th century, and the interest in and importance of ideas of chivalry that existed before the 18th century. Because, of course, the intellectual movement that we know as the Renaissance was about uh, a revival of classical learning, of Roman literary style, of artistic techniques, and, of course, eventually, of the correct use of the Roman uh, architectural orders. It was a revolution in learning, and in England at least, it established itself in the universities, and it was expressed most coherently in letters rather than architecture. And in this sense, um, I believe there was no architectural renaissance in England in the period we are looking at tonight. Whilst certainly it's true, um, elements of classical architecture were absorbed, adapted and applied, only in a minute number of cases was any attempt made to build a building based on the rules of classical architectural grammar. For buildings to be built like this, the Civil War had to come and go, the century had to turn, and the pageantry and romantic chivalry so beloved of the Tudors and the early Stuarts had to fall from fashion. In fact, I think that the Reformation was to be a much more important force than the Renaissance for architectural change. Now, in the mid-1530s, before the Reformation, there were about 840 monasteries, friaries and nunneries in England. 
In addition, there were perhaps 4,000 chantries and guilds. And between them, they owned uh, probably about one-third of the English land stock. And after uh, 1536, the vast majority of this was transferred to secular hands, most of it in a matter of uh, merely 20 years. Now, whilst the um, dissolution of the monasteries was the most visible effect of the suppression, for the average person, their parish church was where the effects of the Reformation were most immediately um, obvious. This um, is Thetford Priory. It's one of my favourite um, ruined uh, monasteries because you can see all the, um, all the face work of the stones has been taken off. Um, and what you're left with um, here is just the... Um, you can see where the face work is taken away and all you're left with is with the core work. And this is one of the sites in the care of English heritage. And, of course, it's a total nightmare to deal with because a building was never designed to look like that. You were never designed to um, conserve this rubble um, inside. But, of course, uh, there were over 800 buildings uh, uh, like this that were um, dissolved. But as I say, this, uh, although it's, in a sense, the sort of most romantic expression of the Reformation, it was the parish churches where people really got a feeling of what was happened. By 1580, the interior of almost every church had been transformed. And, of course, at the heart of the issue was idolatry, the visual context of worship, which, in broad terms, moved from the situation before the Reformation where the pictorial depiction of faith was at the centre of a parish church to a situation where faith was transmitted by words. And so literacy and liturgy entwined as church interiors were filled with painted texts and books. And here's a very good example um, at the parish church at Cartmel in Cumbria, St. Anthony's, with the um, Ten Commandments um, painted uh, and put up on the wall. And I think that you can see in this context the destruction of stained glass in the church, not only ridding the churches of idolatry, but to let light in so that people could read and could read the word, a dual focus of the smashing of glass in these Victorian churches. So this um, assault on traditional religion uh, affected the monasteries. It affected the parish churches. But something we don't often think of is it had a huge impact on the, what I describe as the spatial context of everyday life. Because the early Tudor landscape was suffused at every level with concrete symbols of Christianity. From uh, the early Middle Ages, England was littered with tens of thousands of wayside crosses. Some in, ch in churchyards, some outside churchyards, some in marketplaces, some just at road junctions in prominent spots in the landscape. This is a uh, Binham in Norfolk, not so far from uh, where I live. And the purpose of these were to keep man's mortal soul in the mind's eye. And very often, like this one at Binham, they also marked the progress um, of religious processions so that you could follow from cross to cross. But not only was the countryside littered with crosses, there were holy wells, there were pilgrimage chapels, there were wayside chapels, there were bridge chapels, like this one in St. Ives. There were hermitages. And all these daily reminders of the place of God in men's lives were, in the course of a few years, swept away from the landscape. This suppression of the monasteries um, triggered a revolution in tenure in English towns. In York, for instance as many as two-thirds of the inhabitants found that their landlords had switched. Two-thirds of the buildings in York belonged to church institutions, and as the church land was sold, these uh, buildings were transferred to merchants. The merchants had previously invested their surplus wealth in country estates, but after um, the mid-1530s, they invested their surplus income in properties and towns and became rentiers, became landlords, keen to invest in urban housing. 
And these men were to benefit hugely from rising rental income, which was part of this population pressure that I described at the beginning of my lecture. And the profits from renting, which were very considerable, were reinvested by these merchants in new buildings, accelerating a process that had begun in the late 15th century, when, in many towns, buildings for rental had begun to be constructed more sturdily. So, after the 1540s, stone walling, tile roofs, much more common, and most uh, houses were of two uh, or even three storeys with big masonry chimber sta um, timber sta uh, chimney stacks, stone hearths, and newel stairs. The uh, merchants rebuilt and modernised their own houses between the 1530s and the 1570s too. Um, and here you see uh, quite a, a well-known house um, in Worcester, quite substantial um, uh, uh, building um, of, about, um, of, of about 1600, 1600, 1620. In many of these uh, houses, open halls uh, were replaced by uh, rooms of two storeys with chimneys. And, of course, what this allowed was um, ceilings to be um, introduced. And this is actually quite a humble house in Great Yarmouth, uh, uh, an English heritage property, one of the Yarmouth Row houses. Um, and you can see how uh, the uh, ability to have a chimney and not just have a fire in the middle of your room with smoke going everywhere allowed you to put a chimney in, a, a ceiling in, and decorate your um, ceiling quite um, elaborately. So uh, the Reformation and the change of ownership in, um, in, in cities and towns had a huge, huge impact. Something else that had uh, a huge impact, tri triggered by the Reformation, uh, was the impact on education. Because the Reformation overthrew the church's monopoly on public life. And it created a huge demand for lay administrators and professional men. All these huge transfers of land, which were triggered by the Reformation, required legal literacy amongst landowners and merchants. Aspiring new men wanted their children to be literate and numerate. The gentry and the aristocracy wanted to master classical knowledge um, as a sort of gentlemanly attribute. And the Protestant godly believed that um, education would guard against ignorance, profanity, and idleness. The effect of this was a huge increase in formal education, both at a local level and at the universities. By 1640, the end of the period we're talking about this evening, half of the population of London and a third of rural men could already read. And at least 2.5% of 17-year-old males were going to university, a proportion, I should tell you, that was higher than any time uh, before the Second World War. So a huge number of people going to university. So by the 1530s, monasteries, hospitals, chantries, and collegiate churches uh, provided education for perhaps as many as 5,000 children under 15. Education, never having been a state responsibility, meant that providing an alternative to this arrangement would never be a government priority. But it was recognised by these classes who I've described before who were very concerned about education that the dissolution of the chanceries and uh, the uh, monasteries was going to cause a crisis in education. And royal pragmatism led Edward VI from 1550 to create a number of free grammar schools uh, with endowments from former chantry lands. Initially, there were 26 of these, half of which had originally been chantry schools. But this movement continued under Elizabeth I. Um, and what I'm showing you here is a slightly grainy slide of uh, an Elizabethan school uh, in a village called Godmanchester, just outside Huntingdon in Cambridgeshire. And uh, this fine little school was the school where I was sent when I was five years old, um, just to show how grateful I am to Elizabeth I for continuing this process. 
These Elizabethan schools, like the one in Govanchester, um, were set up not by central government. They were set up by what I describe as civic action. Uh, much like the chantries that preceded them, uh, they were part of the Elizabethan mentality of charitable giving. And uh, it's been calculated that at least a quarter of all Elizabethan charitable gifts went to founding um, schools. The model for these new schools, and there were an awful lot of them built, uh, was probably the school built by Dean Collett uh, of St. Paul's Cathedral in London in 1512. Now, this no longer exists, but uh, basically these schools had um, a schoolroom, very often a chapel attached, and usually a house in which the schoolmaster could live. Here is quite a grand one um, from an old postcard. Uh, this is Guildford Grammar School, built in 1557 and then extended up till 1586. Uh, those of you who've been to Guildford know that if you go through that front door, you enter um, a little courtyard with um, uh, the main schoolroom on one side and the house for the master and the usher on the other side. And um, on the third side, there is a small library. The children uh, were taught in a ground floor room, sitting on forms, from of which, of course, comes the, the phase being in the first form, the second form, the third form, depending on which form you were sitting on. Each form had the people of similar um, age on. And the master um, would be at the end of the room, standing on a, a shallow um, dais. And it seems as if uh, in this school, uh, the attic rooms you can see there in the gables would have been um, dormitories for boarders. Well, this early 17th century um, educational boom um, equally affected higher education. And uh, the, the higher education uh, at this stage is expanding very rapidly because it wasn't just members of the aristocracy or even merchants um, or the gentry who went to university because university places were taken up by the sons of really quite humble and poor people in very large numbers. Uh, money poured into collegiate education just as it had done into the schools and the rich funded no fewer than 500 new scholarships as well as commissioning lavish new buildings and endowments to uh, maintain the dons in um, lavish style and comfort. This was a period of intensive construction for the colleges of Oxford and for Cambridge and for the inns of court. Uh, this is a 19th century print of Middle Temple Hall, London's finest surviving Elizabethan interior. And this is a case in point. And here you see the famous um, screen in the hall. Um, this vast space, um, more or less the same size as the hall um, of Hampton Court, also vaulted by a great double hammer beam roof, and with this incredibly elaborate um, screen, is very much symbolic of the um, ancient origins and the authority and the learning of the um, inn of court. But of all these um, educational establishments, the most um, important and the most ambitious was the new quadrangle built at St. John's College, Oxford, by Archbishop Lord, the Canterbury Quad. Uh, the design uh, of this uh, quadrangle is disputed, but it was certainly um, his personal joiner, a man called Adam Brown, whose name is on the accounts. Undoubtedly, he plundered uh, prints and drawings, possibly from Antwerp, to inspire him. And as a consequence, this quad has sort of defied attempts to uh, categorize it stylistically because it mixes everything together. It mixes medieval fan vaults and battlements and hood mouldings, all of which you can see there, with Tuscan arcades, pediments, and um, an edicilled niche. I'd love to find my... Ah, there's the, the, razor, the, the laser. So, um, excellent. So, you know, gothic battlements, these hood moulds, uh, uh, very much sort of gothic windows here, 
But down below, this Tuscan um, arcade and this niche with pediments over it. So it's a real melange of um, styles. But, you know, I think, although it looks a bit strange to us because we've become so used to be seeing sort of Gothic and classical architecture as, uh, in counterpoint as opposition, I think to Archbishop Lord and his architects and their contemporaries, um, this was admired as a harmonious and rich composition. The uh, east and west courtyard elevations were deliberately emblematic. Here you can see the busts of the virtues and the arts proclaiming Lord's belief in Oxford's medieval curriculum. And that um, frontispiece, um, based on actually counter-Reformation church facades in Paris, combines the arms of the archbishop with um, an image of Charles I. Here, for Archbishop Lord, was the ultimate statement of belief in the Anglican Church, a belief, of course, for which later Lord and his king were to perish. So I'm going to move on from um, education to talk a little bit about towns. Uh, I've already talked about the rapidly growing population of England, and this was to have a very substantial impact on uh, England's towns. In fact, uh, by the 1530s, uh, more or less a quarter of the population of the country was living in towns. But amongst those towns, London's wealth rapidly outstripped everybody else. London's money, of course, first came from its trade in cloth. By 1530, it had 85% of the country's overseas trade. And by 1543, London's tax contribution was as large as all the other towns in England combined. But in the 15th century, the main trading place for London merchants was out in the open in the streets. In fact, uh, mainly in Lombard Street. In 1531, in Antwerp, London's great northern European rival, uh, there was uh, a new building constructed for their merchants, a new bourse, demonstrating the huge benefits of purpose, uh, a purpose-built indoor trading centre. Now, although uh, Henry VIII was very keen to copy uh, the Antwerp bourse, it wasn't until 1564 when Sir Thomas Gresham, London's wealthiest merchant and royal agent in the Netherlands, uh, built uh, one at his own expense. This is the building uh, constructed uh, between 1566 to 67 under the supervision of um, Henry van Passion, probably to the designs of Cornelius Floris. And the concept was a 15th century one, an arcaded courtyard, but of course the style of the arches uh, was very much um, in a classical style. There were these uh, round-headed arches resting directly on top of the columns without um, any entablature. Can you just see the way the columns just sort of come straight down and rest on top of the arches? There's no, um, no uh, uh, moulding between them um, uh, at all. Uh, a sturdy tower uh, rose over the top of the complex. Um, in fact, I think I'm actually showing you slightly the wrong slide here, but anyway... Um, there was a big tower over it, which had um, a, a clock tower, a, a clock in it, which, together with a bell, marked the end of the day's um, trading. You see, during the last um, quarter of uh, Queen Elizabeth's reign, um, London uh, had become the engine of the national economy, and the thing that drove that engine, and this is going to sound very familiar, was shopping because the Royal Exchange included two floors of kiosks above these arches um, selling luxury goods, selling shoes, selling watches, selling silks, gloves, ribbons, and all sorts of other things. And these little shops were very small. They were tiny. They measured five foot by seven and a half foot. But having one could generate huge profits for their tenants. This uh, building was a whole new concept in shopping. Where have you heard that before? 
the elite customers were no longer forced to walk the dirty streets, but could browse in comfort and in relative privacy. But there were other changes which were equally important to the comfort of the rich that had a very, very big impact on London. You see, from the early Middle Ages, anyone with any means, with any money, travelled around uh, London uh, by river. But in the 1550s, there was a social revolution which had huge impacts. And this was the invention of the carriage. Now, the invention of the carriage was actually the Holy Grail, because for centuries, people had been trying to devise a vehicle that could move rapidly over quite bad roads without pulverising the occupants. But in the 1550s, a new type of carriage appeared in England, um, and by um, 1600, their use was no less than a craze. By 1620, by 1620, coachmaking was one of the most lucrative industries in the capital. This is um, a drawing that was done of Nonsuch Palace from life in the 1570s. And it shows here in the foreground one of the very first carriages ever to appear in England. It was a gift uh, to Elizabeth I. We know this is an accurate depiction of it because we have the wardrobe accounts that describes all this, um, these, these sort of curly cue things and the, the feathers on the top and everything. This uh, uh, carriage was the first um, of many that were to transform life um, in London. Before the uh, introduction of carriages, there were very, very few horses stabled in London. But from the 1560s, for every carriage, there had to be at least two horses. And by uh, the early 17th century, many horses, uh, many carriages had four or even six horses. So, the great aristocratic houses along the Strand, like Somerset House, created separate entrances and yards for their stables. So, um, here is Somerset House, with its gardens down to the river. Here's the main courtyard. Uh, here's the, the inner courtyard and the main courtyard. But this area here, approached by its own little alleyway, was, it contained a massive block of stables. Look, that... Those are stables. And it's almost as big as the house itself. And it needed to be um, for all these horses that were needed. And uh, this was a revolution in all these big houses. They all now needed to build big stables. And one, just one, Elizabethan stable and coach house survives in London. Uh, it's at Hampton Court. It's built in 1570. A bit of a giveaway there, isn't there? Um, uh, built in 1570 for Elizabeth I, um, this great archway here um, w was built uh, to allow the carriages um, to go in and these smaller um, archways here to allow the horses um, to come out. Um, however, uh, this was all very well if you owned a massive house like Hampton Court or a massive house like uh, Somerset House. What if you were living in one of the new terraced houses um, elsewhere um, in London? Well, um, this is a map uh, showing um, Covent Garden, uh, laid out, of course, by um, Inigo Jones. And what um, Inigo Jones um, invented in Covent Garden was the solution to what you did with your horses. Um, he's inventing this in the 1630s. Uh, these are the, um, the terraced houses uh, which you approached from the piazza. Behind the terrace house uh, was a garden, and at the bottom of the garden, um, approached by a separate street at the back, were your stables, which were known as your mews. And this uh, was a very, very different solution to what um, had happened in France. In France, if you uh, have a townhouse, you enter it for, uh, in your carriage into a little courtyard from the front. In England, uh, you, your, your coach comes in at the back and your um, horses are kept at the back. And that is the origin of the Meuse house. 
uh, that you see uh, all over London, a random muse, I'm showing you a picture there, invented in the 1630s to deal with this huge problem of a vast number of horses suddenly, in a matter of uh, maybe 30 or 40 years, needing to be um, housed in the centre of the capital. Well, this... Um, proliferation of cro coaches led to a drastic improvement in the road network around London. For 20 to 30 miles around the capital, the roads were now excellent. So for the first time, you could go out to Richmond or to Greenwich for dinner, and you could return the same evening. Um, and uh, this uh, was a very significant factor, because what it meant was that if you were an aristocrat, you could actually build your house out in the clean air of the suburbs and have a nice garden, and you could get in and out uh, on your carriage on a good road um, very quickly. And so uh, there was uh, the invention of a new type of house, the suburban villa. Now, to begin with, these suburban villas weren't particularly architecturally distinctive. Here is a very early one. This is Sutton House in Hackney, belongs to the National Trust. Uh, built in 1535, um, it's barely distinguishable from uh, a small um, country mansion. But from the 1580s, these uh, houses began to be built in a different way. They began to be constructed on a plan that we know as double pile. Now, um, to very briefly explain double pile, for those of you who don't know what it is, this is a, a, just, a, a, for example, a, a plan of uh, Wingfield Manor in Derbyshire, and it shows how all the ranges of the house are basically one room deep everywhere. That's a courtyard there. So everything is basically one room deep. Everything is built on a single pile. A double pile house is when you have rooms too, too deep. So you have a range there, and you have another range next door to it. So these uh, uh, new houses, which were built in double pile, were much more compact um, and meant that you could abandon the sort of linear planning where just one room led to another room, led to another room, led to another room. You could have a much more interesting and complex plan. And these villas, because you have to call them villas, derived ultimately from the plans of townhouses, where the big townhouses that belonged to the merchants uh, were built on these deep, narrow burgage plots. And the obvious uh, solution to building a big house on a narrow uh, plot was uh, to put your chimney stacks in the middle and then to build your rooms on either side. So your house uh, would look like this. This is a very large um, merchant's house in King's Lynn. It happens to be my house, but that's just by the by. Um, there is a big spine wall here which has the flues in, um, and then the rooms were disposed either side, double pile. Um, and this was uh, this uh, house by 1400, was already a double-pile house. And so this uh, notion of building your house double-pile was taken out from the dense, heavily-built core of cities and started to be used um, on these villas built by the aristocracy ringing round the edge of London. Some of you may know Charlton House in Greenwich, built in 1607 to 12, a remarkable survival of this type um, of uh, new house. And here you see a rather smudgy plan of it, which I, which I apologise for. But you can see here, this is the great hall in the house, uh, which runs from front to back, and all the other rooms are double pile, or even triple pile here like this. So this house was a much uh, more complicated house in terms of plan, and they were pioneering a new way of living where you could have different relationships between servants and masters, between landlords and tenants. Living in these houses was a much cheaper, more private, more practical way to live, with warmer, more manageable rooms disposed in such a way that the family and guests could move around um, independently from the servants, because these houses had their own um, uh, servant staircases um, tucked away in them. So you have a big staircase there for the family, and then you have a, a servant staircase tucked away. Now, of course, um, the period that we're talking about is a period in which um, printing becomes very important. And printing, in fact, revolutionised the spread of knowledge. And this was particularly important in terms of architecture. 
because for the first time, printing made it possible to distribute thousands of copies of drawings cheaply and quickly. And these uh, architectural prints started coming into England from the 1460s, but uh, by the early 16th century, there were a number of books, and one of these was outstandingly important for the period that I'm talking about. This was a book uh, written by Sebastiano Serlio um, called The General Rule of Architecture, um, Regole Generale Architetturi. And this was a new concept, a completely new concept um, in architectural writing. This was a profusely illustrated book showing um, the orders of architecture, Tuscan, Doric, Ionic, Corinthian, composite. And this book and the drawings that it contained uh, became hugely influent, um, influential um, for the rest of the period that I am um, going to be talking about this evening. But as well um, as many buildings that picked up these orders as a sort of decorative motif, there were one or two, and there really were only one or two buildings, which tried to use them in a correct Roman manner. And the first of these, as far as we know, was Somerset House. This is a drawing of Somerset House showing the strand elevation and the um, great triumphal arch um, in the centre of it built for Protector Somerset with a sort of tier of classical um, columns um, on it. Here is an in inside view of the courtyard, uh, a, a watercolour here in the Museum of London, as the building's being demolished, and you can see... Uh, the archway here with its columns on. This was a triumphal arch in the middle of uh, London for one of uh, the Tudor period's greatest generals, Protector Somerset, um, trying to express his power in the classical language of architecture. And this um, desire to have a frontispiece on the front of your building with the classical orders on uh, took a polite building by storm. Here's another um, London building, Kew Palace. Also, can you see here um, the orders of architecture, um, a tower of orders, it was called, on um, the entrance um, front, built in 1620. But really, uh, even in the 1640s, the underlying principles of English architectural design were not in any sense strictly classical. A building like Kew Palace owed as much to the Gothic world as it did to the world of the Italian Renaissance. Because the English were obsessed by surface decoration, by surface richness. You can only need to look at that building to see the love of interplay of how you make the surface rich. And uh, from the 1560s, um, a huge craze gripped England, which was the craze for strap work. And here you see this... Um, uh, wonderful ceiling at Aston Hall, just outside um, Birmingham. Look at that ceiling. Um, look at the panelling on the walls. The English have always loved surface decoration. Right the way back through my lectures, I've made this point. Um, and these uh, types uh, of designs, and this is the outside of Brams Hill House, were, were taken from books of prints that were printed in the Netherlands and were applied willy-nilly to the surface of English um, architecture. All these uh, sources of new design derived from prints were complementary to the existing decorative vocabulary of English architecture. In particular, the language of heraldry. Because what underpinned all these uh, buildings was the desire of the owners to express their status and their ancestry. This, as I say, is Brams Hill House, and this inside is the screen in the Great Hall. This is heraldry gone mad. Uh, you can see they have put uh, the shields of every conceivable ancestor who they could imagine, including, um, fascinatingly, 12 blank shields for the generations to come. So in the minds of these patrons, the classical orders and heraldry with the same thing. Look, they, these, these shields are put onto classical columns because uh, heraldry was about symmetry, it was about order, it was about hierarchy, and so was classical art architecture, symmetry, order, hierarchy. 
There was no contradiction in their minds. Well, of course, the ultimate expression of this mix of heraldry um, and uh, 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 forms brought from the continent in terms of prints uh, was seen in the royal palaces. Uh, the royal palaces started by Cardinal Wolsey and then um, developed by um, Henry VIII. And Henry VIII um, at uh, Hampton Court and later on at York Place uh, developed this extraordinary um, style which I call chivalric eclecticism. <laughs> so the basis of it is chivalry, but you add everything you can think of on top of it, eclecticism. And this is York Place. This is my reconstruction sketch of what it would have looked like at the end of Henry VIII's reign. Um, a building that was a sort of fantasy building covered in flags and veins and badges and coats of arms and columns. Um, no square of space left undecorated. But very often when we... Um, uh, and, 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 of course, the, 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 the culmination of this style was Nonsuch Palace. I showed you a picture of it earlier. Um, Nonsuch really epitomises this chivalric eclecticism that um, grips Henry VIII and his courtiers um, and, and, and turns into the sort of extraordinary excesses of the Elizabethan and Jacobean um, era. But when we think of Henry VIII, um, and we do all too often, because he's a very popular monarch, um, we do think of Nonsuch, we think of Whitehall, we think of Hampton Court. But just as important were his works of fortification. Because in 1538, Henry VIII became convinced that a Catholic crusade to invade England was inevitable. And he commissioned one of the greatest uh, suites of uh, defensive buildings that had been, that had been um, commissioned in England since the age of Edward I. From Lowestoft in the east, right the way round the coast of England to Milford Haven in the west, he built a series of extraordinary forts, a total of 24 new fortifications. Uh, and here you see Camber Castle, a typical one of these artillery forts. Because this is what these were. These were about artillery. These were magnificent killing machines designed to emit the maximum number of cannonballs and musket balls to prevent an enemy gaining an anchorage for invasion. They weren't designed to uh, resist um, a land-based siege or bombardment for the sea. They were simply designed to have the maximum number of cannons. And so each of these layers you see here um, was dominated by cannons. And the, the lowest gun ports down here, there was another layer of cannon here, there's another layer of cannon there, and there would have been cannon on the top. It would have been spouting fire um, in every direction. But Henry's forts, um, although they never um, fired a shot in anger, actually, as it, as it uh, happened, um, were, with continual maintenance and modification, the backbone of England's coastal defences throughout Elizabeth's reign um, and through to the um, Spanish Armada. So um, let's move on for royalty and just briefly consider um, courtiers, the, um, the rich men of the kingdom, the aristocrats. This was the period um, of the uh, aristocratic builder who had made his fortune in public service. Now, speaking as a public servant, uh, I know this sounds like an extraordinary notion that you could ever make a fortune in public service. But of course, in the 16th and 17th century, that's exactly what you did. You didn't get it through your salary, which was negligible, but you got it through the profits of office. And of all the great builders um, in the um, Elizabethan and Jacobean period, uh, William Cecil, Lord Burley, the Lord Treasurer, was the greatest. Uh, he built a great house in Westminster and two huge houses in the country, Burley in Northamptonshire and Tibbles in um, Hertfordshire. And here is Burley, designed by one of the leading designers of the Royal Office of Works. He's got the Royal Architect to build his own personal house, a man called Henry Hawthorne. What this house did was emphasise traditional architectural and social values on the outside. Look, a traditional 
um, gatehouse with a tower of orders um, on it. And inside was a traditional great hall. But when you went inside into the courtyard, what Burley was trying to do was emphasize his uh, classical learning, his classical knowledge. And you can see here um, the arcades. This arcade is actually taken directly, you'll probably recognize it, from um, the Royal Exchange. See, that's exactly the same thing without the entablature. Um, and the Tower of Orders you see here, um, uh, and lots of um, strap work decoration. Uh, a very, very fashionable interior, proclaiming the sophistication of the, uh, uh, of the, 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 the patron. Now, um, just to finish off, I want to move from these great houses, and I'm not going to go through, there were dozens of these great houses built in very much the style. I just want to move from that to uh, the houses of the very poor, because what I've tried to do in these lectures is not give a distorted view of building in England, just concentrating on the high end. Because in the period I'm talking about tonight, there were some major changes, one particular change I want to hi highlight in, if you like, the low end. Uh, as I explained in my previous lecture, between 1400 and about 1530, England was dogged by low population, people were scarce, and land was plenty. Villages shrank, and land holdings increased in size. Rents were lower, uh, and tenure was more secure. And in fact, most villages were smaller in 1520 than they had been in 1530. But this trend was reversed in the early 1500s by this rise in population that I've talked about. And this population growth uh, resulted not only uh, in growing villages and towns, but in growing um, prosperity, uh, particularly in the countryside, because the countryside was uh, having to find ways of feeding the towns. And this made the countryside... Uh, uh, from large parts of the countryside, much more profitable. So during the 17th century, almost all houses in the countryside were working farms. Um, and this increasing profitability resulted in a lot of them being rebuilt. And the big thing that happens um, in this period is an advance in the control of smoke. Now, I've already mentioned this briefly when I was talking about towns. But first by the introduction of smoke hoods, and then by the construction of chimneys and fireplaces, it was possible to revolutionize the design of ordinary houses. Now, it is actually pretty surprising that the Romans, clever as they were, inventing everything you can possibly imagine, never invented the chimney. It's very odd that they didn't do that. Um, and we think probably the first fireplaces and chimneys uh, appeared in the houses of Saxon royalty. But really, up until um, the reign of Henry VIII, a fireplace and a chimney was a rarity and a luxury con con confined to, um, uh, to, to high-status dwellings. But the, the, the rash of rebuilding that took place um, from Henry VIII's reign onwards allowed lots and lots of houses to, to profit from this technology, because it was technology. And here is a random picture of somebody's house. Um, but it is actually a little Tudor house, quite a humble cottage. You can see its, um, its beams on, on the ceiling there, um, with a fireplace and a chimney. And because your fire wasn't in the middle of the floor and the, and the smoke was uh, going up to the roof, you were able to put ceilings in. And because you were able to put ceilings in, you were able to have a second floor. And so these are two um, uh, houses from the Weald and Downland Museum, uh, before and after. Before, when your smoke was going out to the roof, that's all you could have. But afterwards, with your chimney stack in the middle, uh, you could have rooms above. And the house on the right, which was a, a sort of house that was developed in the south of England uh, during the years uh, from the sort of 1530s and 40s onwards, became the blueprint of ordinary houses in England right up to the, the 19th century. Um, a house built around um, a spine which had a, a, a chimney stack in the middle of it with rooms on either side um, and a door um, in the front. Well, um, just to um, see if I can make some conclusions out of that 
again, breathless uh, uh, conspectus of what was being built in this hundred years. Throughout this period I've been talking about, the period from the dissolution of the monasteries until the Civil War, ideas of chivalry, of knighthood, and the power of Gothic architecture really dominated building in England. In many spheres, uh, the period from 1530 to 1630 was one of exuberance and of extravagance. And I hope that many of the examples of buildings I've shown you this evening have, has captured that. A period of voracious and conspicuous consumption and spendthrift um, patrons. From the reign of Edward VI, it was almost as if all the architectural energy and all the flamboyance of the church was channeled into secular building. And this was, I think, the fundamental change that we're grappling with here. From an architecture that was continually renewed and invigorated by the interplay between ecclesiastical and secular modes to an architecture that was entirely secular, being fed by new streams of decoration, mainly coming from abroad. Well, in my next lecture, on the 2nd of November, I will show how in the 100 years after the Restoration, English architecture went through another fundamental change, driven in the main by the avail availability of a whole new library of architectural books. Books that began to standardise style and reduce the quirkiness and invention that has characterised the Tudor and early Stuart buildings that we've looked at tonight. Thank you very much. <clears throat>well, ladies and gentlemen, I do have um, eight and a quarter minutes to answer um, any questions or hear any comments or suggestions that anyone has. So uh, there's a roving mic as usual. If anyone would like to kick off. Um, could you comment on the uh, connection between muses for horses and muses for hunting birds? And what's the origin of the word muse? Yes, well, that is a, a, a good and interesting question because, as, as you rightly um, suggest, the, the origin of the word... Um, was uh, a muse for hawks, and um, Henry VIII had, uh, at Greenwich, where he kept most of his hunting birds, a big hawk's muse. Um, it was rather remarkably uh, uh, accessible, almost directly from his bedroom. Um, so, you know, he must have had a very high value um, against them. The, uh, the royal muse uh, in, in Whitehall uh, was actually up near Charing Cross, um, and... Uh, in the later 16th century, when uh, it ceased to be uh, a, a muse for birds, it was taken over by horses. And so a building that was called the Royal Muse uh, became a building that stabled horses. Uh, and subsequently, the word muse stuck to horses um, rather than birds. Um, and of course, the National Gallery is the building that's now on the, the, the site of that. So you're quite right, originally the word muse related to birds, but ends up because of this swap over um, relating to horses. There's a gentleman there, yeah. Yes. Uh, how was uh, English architecture regarded by the Europeans? Well, that's an extremely, uh, extremely interesting um, question. And uh, <clears throat> in my view, um, the architecture of this period is written, uh, has been written by uh, historians up until very recently, uh, very apologetically. They look at what's being built in Italy. They look at what's being built in France. And they look at houses like Burley, and they um, say, oh, this is terribly barbaric. Now, compared to what um, Brunelleschi was building, this is really very northern and sort of old-fashioned. And uh, I, I think that um, they've missed a very, very um, important point, which is that uh, Lord Burley and his um, companions weren't trying to imitate uh, architecture in southern Europe, they were doing their own thing. And we shouldn't judge these, uh, these buildings uh, against buildings in France or Spain or Italy. We should judge them uh, for what they are. And a number of scholars writing recently, and uh, it certainly includes me, but includes Marc Girouard and one or two others, have been forcibly making the point that these buildings stand up uh, 
for themselves um, in terms of their quality and their coherence and their um, aesthetic qualities. But it has to be said, if you were um, an Italian walking into this courtyard, you would uh, think that you had been on a hallucinogenic drug <laughs> because it doesn't look anything like uh, the use um, of the classical orders. You might sort of pick out bits and pieces that you'd sort of recognise there, but, I mean, what do you make of that? You know, I mean, it is quite extraordinary. So um, when uh, uh, foreign visitors come, they are all very much impressed by the size, uh, the scale, the ambition uh, of these places, um, and they are very much impressed by the interiors, but they, uh, when they come to describing the exteriors, words fail them. <laughs> because just as with modern art historians, they haven't, we haven't found a language that is adequate for describing this style of architecture, so they couldn't do it at the time. And I invented a, a term, this chivalric eclecticism, to describe the words of Henry VIII, but what word could describe what you're looking at there? It's very difficult to, to work out. So it's a very interesting question you've asked, sir. Uh, just up there, there's a lady, I think. Just to follow on from that, then, uh, is there a, a more of a continuity with Northern Europe, like um, the Netherlands or the Baltic states? Yes, uh, the, the very much is uh, more, more of a continuity. And uh, definitely, uh, details like this, which I, I showed you at the Royal Exchange and here, um, have direct parallels um, in, uh, in, in Northern Europe. And I think the, the way to, to look at it, in my view, isn't uh, so much that uh, what was happening here was a direct copy of what was happening somewhere else, but what was happening in Northern Europe was that the merchants who were living in uh, London and living in Antwerp lived in a common cultural milieu, uh, and they uh, shared uh, common uh, aesthetic experiences, they had a common cultural, educational background, they were looking at the same books, um, and they were building thing things that were um, in some ways uh, uh, very similar. And I think that when you look at the mercantile buildings, and particularly things like the Royal Exchange and the, the, the houses of the merchants, uh, my own house in King's Lynn, these houses have very, very direct um, parallels with the houses of, the, of Northern Europe, particularly the houses of the, the Hansa, the Hanseatic League. I think when you're looking at the houses of the aristocracy, you're looking at something that is very different and much more original and much more um, unique to, to England. Yes, I was just thinking of the 17th century, um, often termed Baroque. Um, I know it's accredited to Caravaggio, who is accredited with turning from mannerism, sort of biblical, mythical, classical, into right in your face Baroque. You've also got the music, the Baroque. But you've also got the architecture, which I always think is crazy paving, but in the sky with steeples and spires, and we seem to be, you know, lagging behind somewhat. Yes, I, mean, I think that one of the things that I've tried to do in these um, lectures is try to avoid art historical tags, because I actually think that none of them really fit England very well. I was very damning about the term Renaissance earlier, um, and in my next lecture on the 2nd of November, I'm going to be very damning about the term Baroque, because I don't think that it helps us understand what is being built in England in the early 17th century. And this is this uh, terrible problem that we have in this country, that um, so many of the uh, art historians and uh, architectural historians who write uh, about these buildings and about our history do it in relation to what is happening in southern Europe, when southern Europe, quite frankly, has got absolutely nothing to do with what's going on here. And so I do think that, that uh, one of the things I'm trying to do in, in the work that I'm doing, that, 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 and I'm uh, writing a book on all this stuff at the moment, is trying to find a new language, a new way of expressing the changes that happen in English architecture without being bound by talking about Romanesque, you know, uh, Gothic, Baroque, post-modernism, uh, you know, goodness knows what other the, the labels are. How successful I am being and will be, you will have to judge. <laughs> Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you.